and uh, Mordecai Ogada. I um, let you also introduce yourself uh, to the audience and uh, yes, and, and explain uh, what NRT is um, uh, and what kind of conservation they are they're doing. Thank you, Mordecai. Thank you, thank you, Fio, and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mordecai Ogada. I'm a wildlife ecologist and a conservation writer. I also consult for Survival International on human rights issues in conservation. Now, for those of you who don't know, I'd like to introduce what NRT is. NRT is a wildlife conservation NGO. Started around its activity started around 2004 in northern Kenya, based at Lewa Wildlife Conservancy. It has it has since grown to cover to cover an area of over 20 conservancies in um, Isiolo, Samburu, Marsabit, Turkana, and Lamu counties, and Laikipia County as well. That thus far, so it has it has grown exponentially as, and into a very big organization. And this is on the back of very high levels of funding from foreign governments, including USAID, um, AFD, uh, um, Agence Française de Développement, um, Danida as well, and DFID, which is which is the UK governmental funding agency. In addition to that, they have a lot of funding as well from wealthy individuals. Now, NRT started, as I said, as a conservation organization um, concerned with wildlife conservation and maintaining wildlife habitats. And somewhere along the line, suddenly they, their focus changed to peace and security. So the, the, the peace stroke security sector became their primary goal or purpose. Now, this, this creates obviously created a lot of questions because um, non-governmental organizations um, are general or civil society is not involved in security operations, is legally not supposed to be involved in security operations. And security operations in Kenya is not even devolved to county government. It is still a preserve of the central national government. Uh, well, NRT has continued with this and, uh, and trained hundreds of personnel in tactical training, use of weapons, it, they have deployed a lot of surveillance equipment and have, have a central control room that surveys large areas of northern Kenya in terms of, in terms of security. And th this going on also raised a number of questions because there have been human rights violations in the name of the maintenance of this security over the years. So this has raised a lot of questions, but they've still managed to retain that status through close connections with Kenya government. Now, bringing us, um, bringing us to the present, as security obviously is not a very financially profitable um, uh, operation to be involved in, NRT now has, has changed, has sort of morphed, morphed again into, into the carbon sequestration, carbon credit or carbon offsetting business, which is a big business globally today. And especially because in the West and the global North, there's a lot of polluters who will pay millions of dollars to people in other parts of the world, typically in the global South, to maintain carbon sinks or carbon offsetting programs by which they can offset their emission or pollutions, or the emissions or pollution in the Americas and Europe particularly. So this is, this is what got us here. And because of the, serious, uh, the, the very high amounts of money involved, it has become a capitalist, capitalist operation and capitalism sort of demands violence, uh, profit, profiteering demands violence. And this is now what is being protected by the quote unquote security personnel they have developed earlier. But this, as more money comes in, they require more and more land for the carbon sequestration. And this will require more and more violence. Up to this date, Kenya uh, NRT occupies or controls about 44,000 square kilometers in Kenya, which is something approaching 10% of Kenya's land mass. And this is, this, this is a serious challenge to communities that need to use natural resources 
um, that that need to move freely across their landscapes and and various other various other function of typical rural societies. Now, um, NRT is, is a difficult organization to define, but very powerful. We've recently found out that NRT was originally registered in 2009 as a land company, which is a private company with shareholders who, who are listed in the, in the registration certificate. Now, this raises other legal questions of why foreign governments are giving their taxpayers money to a private, privately owned company with a group of around nine shareholders, 10 shareholders. So this raises other legal questions, but it shows that what NRT is, is very much a front for capitalism. And what the cause they are advancing is the cause of capitalists amongst, amongst whom are their donors. So this, this, this march of capitalism into, into conservation needs to be stopped because we cannot control or limit human rights violations as long as we let capitalism and profiteering get into natural resource management. This is why we all need to be closely aware of what is going on, particularly those whose homes happen to lie in the areas where NRT is active. This organization, as I said, has become very powerful in, in the communities where they operate, and they've become very powerful in Kenya as well with direct connection with very high offices, even within the Kenya government and the security forces. And we hope that this, this webinar this afternoon will help enlighten people into what they're dealing with and, and show us what we need to do in order to ensure that our rights and the rights of our communities are respected by all in order to avoid violent resource conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mordecai. Uh, so now it's um, Simon, uh, Simon Council, that is a, a consultant of Survival International that has been also for 30 years, I think, running uh, the uh, Rainforest, Rainforest Foundation UK. And so we are very lucky to have him here also. Um, thank you, Mordecai, too. Uh, just one thing to say that this is the first time we are doing this uh, workshop and so it's uh, like for us it's also a kind of, of experiment to see how well it goes. Um, so again, if you after this, you still have questions and comment, please put them in the questions and answers box. Um, yeah, so Simon, you can also introduce yourself as more like I did. Thank you. Great, thanks very much. Yes, as, so as Fiori says, uh, my name is Simon Council. I've been working uh, with on running organizations to help uh, strengthen the rights of indigenous people uh, the world over for all of my working life. Uh, and I, about three years ago, started working independently and then as a researcher and an advisor to Survival International. And we started getting interested, let's say, in, in what's happening in northern Kenya about um, about three years ago, actually, and, and especially alerted by the very worrying um, reports of very serious human rights abuses occurring at the hands of NRT's rangers and the reported increase in, in violence that was occurring um, in that area. <clears throat> And we became aware of this thing called the uh, this carbon offset project that NRT is running and, and started um, over a year ago, actually, to, to investigate what was going on about this. I have experience in the past in, in investigating these kinds of carbon offset projects, as they're called. They're technically quite complicated. Um, <clears throat> and this one was particularly difficult, actually. And I'll, I'll, I'll try my best to explain um <clears throat> what we found and uh in in ways that i mean are maybe still a little difficult i mean they're, they're hard for me to understand some of what was going on with some of this to be honest anyway I, i've got quite a long presentation that i i'm going to share my screen so you don't have to look at me for the next half an hour or so i hope you can all um see it uh and here we go
Can you all uh, see my screen? I, I can't actually see it now, so I'm not quite sure what you can see, but um, yes, yeah, I can, yeah, I can see it. Yeah, you, yeah. that's fine. Okay, yeah. So yeah, here we are. Um, we're talking about the Northern Kenya Grasslands Carbon Project, which is being run by NRT. Um, well, Mordecai has explained what NRT is. I think we all know what Northern Kenya grasslands are like. But what exactly is a carbon project? And I, I'm going to have to kind of go back almost to, to kind of first principles with some of this and, 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 and explain exactly kind of why, what carbon is actually and why it's important. Um, then I'll go on to talk about the project uh, and exactly how that's supposedly working. Then some of the problems um, that we believe exist with this project. And then um, uh, come to some conclusions at, at the end of it and some of the latest developments over the last few months or so. Hopefully there'll be plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end of this. Um, and you can also write them down in the in the Q and A uh, box as well. So, carbon. What is it, and why is it why is it important? Well, it's one of the um, most abundant chemical elements on Earth, and it's kind of founding uh, a building block of all forms of life. Actually, there is carbon in every single life form. And the one way to kind of think about this. Um, if you know you don't have qualifications in chemistry or physics or anything like that, um, is if you imagine the process of making charcoal, you start with a pile of logs like this or wood, you cover it up, you set fire to it, you ignite it, and over a course of hours or days like this, it turns into this. It's basically being reduced to what is almost uh, effectively pure carbon. So what you, what you started with um, has, has had everything, else, more, more or less everything else removed, all these logs, and now you've got this element essentially of pure carbon. And carbon kind of can actually take many different forms in, in terms of gases and in diamonds are made of carbon actually, but that's a rare form of it, of course. But carbon is often kind of seen like this. As I say, it, it exists in every single life form, including in humans. About a fifth of humans is made out of carbon. It's not separated out like this. That would be very, very weird, of course. It's all mixed together with different elements and very complex kind of uh, um, compounds that are based on, on carbon. Carbon in cows and zebras and elephants, trees and grass everywhere. Every single life form has carbon in it. It's quite an abundant chemical. But let's go back to our charcoal. What happens when we burn charcoal you know, to make our dinner, for example? Well, we know that we start with a you know fairly a, a large bag of charcoal. We burn it. We get lots of heat to cook our dinner on, and at the end of it, we end up with a little pile of ash, basically, and not very much at all. So, where has the everything else gone? Where has the rest of the the volume that was there, the the, the weight of it, where has it gone? Apart from the ash and some smoke and so on, most of it has turned into gases and escaped into the into the atmosphere. <laughs> and most important amongst is it produced the burning of charcoal and other carbon, like wood and so on. I'll come on to that in a moment. Um, creates a number of gases, and one of the most important of those is carbon dioxide. And what you'll keep hearing about this this chemical compound called carbon dioxide. It's a gas combination of carbon and oxygen, which is what we all breathe and it's all present in the air. You'll see it has a chemical symbol. CO2 is a kind of short way of writing carbon dioxide. You can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. And, and, and so it's very hard to know that it's there, but it is there, it's in the atmosphere and it always has been <clears throat> present. It's what we breathe, it's part of what we breathe out when we breathe. The gas carbon dioxide. And <clears throat> anything with carbon in it, like charcoal or wood, or things that used to be alive, like oil or coal, they all produce carbon dioxide when they burn. So when you put petrol in your car and you run the engine, it burns uh, the carbon in the petrol and it produces carbon dioxide. If you run a small motor like this, it produces carbon dioxide. When you put diesel in your truck, it produces carbon dioxide. Most importantly, 
over the years, the biggest producers of carbon dioxide could be we burn huge amounts of coal and oil, I mean energy uh, to produce electricity, um, factories to produce various goods, including cement and so on. If you burn anything in any of those factories to produce energy or some other activity, you produce carbon dioxide, and that goes into the atmosphere. And the thing about this gas carbon dioxide is that it tends to stay in the atmosphere. <clears throat> uh, you don't need to know the, see the details of this so much, but this shows the amount of carbon dioxide that's been present in the atmosphere for the last 2,000 years, going back to the time of the birth of Christ. <clears throat> um, at the so uh, you can see that for about oh, you know, 1,800 years or so, and actually for many, many, many years before that, the amount of carbon dioxide was pretty low. This is in parts per million. It's 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 less than much less than one percent. It's maybe like you know one teaspoon of milk in a bucket of milk. It, that's the kind of concentration uh, that carbon dioxide is at. But you'll see there on this chart around about eighteen hundred, when industrialization started in countries like UK and Germany and America. We started burning lots of coal and petrol. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere started to increase rapidly. And it's about 50% more now than it was before industrialization. And the thing about this, and this is the most important part in, in some ways, but actually quite hard to show here, because again, it's a whole process that you can't see and you can't, it's very hard to sense actually, is that the more of this gas carbon dioxide that exists in the atmosphere, the more of the heat from the sun that is hitting the earth all the time gets trapped in the atmosphere. You can see that in this right hand picture there because these carbon uh, gases, carbon dioxide is the most important, but there are some others and they all get, also get produced when you burn living things or fossil fuels as they call coal and petrol. They all have the ability to trap heat and so a result of this, a result of there being more of this carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere for the last you know, 200 years or so, has been that slowly the temperature of the Earth and the Earth's atmosphere has been increasing. Again, you don't need to know the details here, but you can see from this graph how the average global temperature has gone up by about one degree, maybe a little bit more than, more than that. And it's carrying on increasing year by year, little bit by little bit. And hence, you know, this process of uh, the increase of carbon in the atmosphere is led to what is now called global warming. The Earth is slowly getting warmer. More accurately, uh, in fact, called global climate change, because it's not only getting warmer on the Earth generally, but also the kind of big weather patterns, like when the rains fall in northern Kenya, for example, or when storms come in North America or Europe, or you know when the ice melts in the, in the very cold parts of the Earth, all of these things are starting to to change, and they all have can have bigger effects as they kind of combine to change uh, the, the weather patterns around the world, and that can be reflected in increasing droughts, for example, as some parts like Northeast Africa, for example, are getting tending to get hotter and drier and droughts are becoming more frequent. It can also be reflected in bigger and stronger storms in coastal cities throughout the world. You see in the bottom left here how New Orleans completely flooded a few years ago, probably due to these big global change in, in climate patterns and weather patterns. And one of, another one of the consequences of this is that some areas like the big forests of North America, um, parts of South America as well, and Northern Asia and Russia and so on, they're also becoming drier and hotter and much more prone to fire. And that in turn, of course, produces a lot more carbon into the atmosphere, a lot more heat going into the atmosphere. So this has a kind of reinforcing effect on this slow process of, of climate change. It's called a positive feedback loop. You don't need to know about that too much. Anyway, so this is the problem. And uh, because these, this, could, this could represent serious danger to humanity and many, you know, many people living on Earth as these terrible weather patterns start to, 
start to advance. And that's why since about 1992, so 30 years ago, um, the United Nations started to try and kind of act uh, to, to, to stop this process of, of global climate change. And there was a big United Nations agreement signed to that effect. It's not been very effective, actually. In fact, it's been almost completely ineffective, but that's the way it is. So what's this got to do with Northern Rangelands Trust and its, its, its um, grasslands carbon project? Well, it needs, again, it needs a little bit of background explanation before I go into this so much. So you see here that there's, there's, there's factories producing this pollution or power stations producing pollution, cars and engines and everything that burns fossil fuels is producing this gas carbon that's going into the atmosphere. There are two things, there are basically two things you can do about that. You can either stop the pollution from coming in the first place or you can try and get that carbon back out of the atmosphere. And the first there are ways of doing this. It means we just have to stop burning oil and petrol and things like that. The second, we know it can work because if trees and all forms of life uh, absorb and contain uh, this carbon, in theory, the more if you grow a lot more trees, you will capture a lot more of that carbon back from the atmosphere. It's called carbon sequestration, carbon storage, let's say. So that's one of the things that's being tried alongside slowly stopping the pollution in the first place. Also, this idea of uh, capturing more um, carbon, in, especially in trees. But it's not only trees, actually, where you can capture this carbon back out from the atmosphere. And another way, well, the next in theory, most important possible way of doing it is by capturing the carbon in the soil. And that's because, so all plants, as I say, and vegetation, grasses, bushes, everything kind of living like that, um, it absorbs a little bit of carbon as it grows. And it then releases some of that carbon into the soil where it stays. It gets trapped there, basically. So these plants are effectively taking carbon out of the atmosphere, which is a good thing, and storing it in the soil. And this is essentially what the Northern Kenya Grasslands Carbon Project is claiming to be doing. It's trying to store more carbon, taking it out of the atmosphere and storing it in the soil. Now, there's another thing we need to, <laughs> we need to understand. I'm sorry, this is, this take, that does take quite a lot of explanation because it's a very complex, complex process. As I say, there are two ways you can you can you can prevent this problem of global climate change and this have there being too much carbon in the atmosphere. The first is, you show you on the right here, the, the people that are making most of the pollution, mostly in rich and industrialized countries who, who, are, who are burning the fossil fuels, burning the coal, burning the oil, and so on, they can either stop it themselves, which will stop more carbon going into the atmosphere, or as has been starting to happen over the last 10 years or so, they can carry on doing what they're doing, and that's very profitable for them, and they can pay someone else, somewhere else, and as Mordecai rightly said, mostly, in fact, in the global south, in countries like Kenya, the polluting companies can pay someone else to try and capture that carbon for them. And they do that through this process of carbon offsetting. So on the left here, you see that someone's planted some new trees, let's say, or they're capturing the carbon in the soil. They, by doing that, they create these things called carbon credits. So they're having a positive effect on the, on the atmosphere. They then sell those carbon credits to the company that wants to carry on polluting, but not be seen be carrying on polluting. So kind of supposedly canceling out the pollution that this company is uh, is res responsible for that's the that's the theory at least of how this is supposed to work and as mordecai said this has turned into a massive industry worth billions and billions of, of, of dollars every year of various projects and there are thousands of these projects around the world claiming to store more carbon than they would have been before and then selling their kind of credits if you like they're like indulgences in in a sense to these um, companies that are responsible for polluting, who then say, we have prevented our pollution, which they haven't actually done, of course, they've just bought 
paid someone else to prevent pollution. And that is the principle of how the NRT carbon project is working. NRT is claiming to capture more carbon in the soil and they're selling their credits for that. They're kind of, um, you know, uh, like tokens. Again, you can't actually see these carbon credits. They're just kind of accounting um, uh, figures. They sell those to polluting companies. Right, so we get on to NRT itself. Well, we know who <coughs> NRT is. Um, Founded here by Ian, Ian Craig in, um, someone will correct me, I think it was in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and uh, here we see him receiving an award last year from Prince William, the future King of England, for services to conservation in Africa. And as Mordecai said, they've been a big force for conservation. They now, supposedly, they now control more than 10% of, of Kenya through the 40-something uh, conservancies that exist, mostly in the north, but also in coastal southeast uh, Kenya. And the carbon project was basically, is being run by them, but also with this um, US-based conservation organization called the Nature Conservancy. It's the world's biggest conservation organization and the richest and um, who is very much in favor of using these kind of carbon trading, carbon offsetting mechanisms to raise funds for conservation. And importantly, by another organization, actually it's more or less one person, um, this uh, American scientist and consultant called Mark Ritchie, who lives in New York state and runs this organization called Soils for the Future, which has been responsible for much of the uh, the kind of technical work and the preparation of the kind of technical documents behind this project. It's kind of developed, in fact, it developed the entire model for how this, this project um, would work. And so this project, it covers um, 13 of the uh, conservancies in, in Northern Kenya. You see them in Namanyuk, Malako, Bilipo, Beleza, uh, Sarah, Nasulu, Ngwesi, and so on, um, which uh, between them are about 2 million hectares. So it's about half of NRT's total combined area and about 5% of the total land area of Kenya. And they claim that it's the world's largest soil carbon project and the first generating carbon credits reliant on modified livestock grazing practices. And that's really important. We'll come back to that in a moment. And here, uh, and I will leave this up just, just to read this, because this is important. This is, this is how, what they say, how the project basically works, is trying to remove these climate changing gases, greenhouse gases from the atmosphere by implementing sustainable grazing management across those 13 um, conservancies. And it says that past overgrazing by pastoralists, it names the six ethnic groups there, overgrazing by pastoralists has depleted the soils of organic matter, i.e. carbon. It's greatly reduced vegetation cover and the potential for grazing for, for livestock. So it's basically saying that the traditional grazing patterns that have been operating over it, these areas um, from obviously many, many years have depleted the amount of carbon in the soil, and we're going to change that. We're going to get that carbon back. And the this this is uh, so that that previous slide was wording taken from the, the the project's own kind of project description of itself, and it's it's what it based the whole project is based upon. And this is a diagram that's also included in that uh, in that document, and it kind of explains it again. They say what they're trying to trying to do is change what they say at the moment is this continuous grazing, as you see here in the picture. It's all kind of chaotic. Look, as there's cows and all over the place. They're not. Uh, they're they're only selectively foraging for the best plants. They're only eating the best plants, and they're leaving lots of un inedible plants behind. It results in there being no kind of storage of grass or build up of grass for for droughts or whatever. There's no recovery of the vegetation um, and there's no rest for the vegetation and then it's all bad and everything's going wrong. That's that's what they say is, uh, and it's depleted the carbon in the soils as, as, a, as a result of depleting the vegetation. That's what they say. And instead of that, 
the scheme is going to, the project is going to implement what they call planned rotational grazing. And in this, as depicted in their own, uh, their own diagram here, effectively NRT or the grazing coordinators or the, 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 the kind of gra grazing um, facilitators, I can't remember what they call them now, they kind of co they, they, they take control of the, of, the, of the animals and that's all cattle and camels and goats and sheep and donkeys. They take control of those from individual families or groups of families and they centralize them in each of the conservancies or several groups of the conservancies. And they make sure that their cows move around. They go graze one place one day, they go move on, move somewhere else the next day, and then the next day, the next day. And you know, in with some kind of plan of how they're going to do this. And this, they say, by taking control of grazing like this, means that there's better foraging. It means the, the vegetation recovers. You get this creation of these kind of grass banks, as they call them, for drought and dry season. Vegetation recovers and it rests and so on. It's all much better. You have more vegetation. And because of that, you have this process of the vegetation being able to store more carbon in the soil. That's what they say. And what they claim, again, this is all from the project's own um, documentation, is that by doing this, they will store about 750 kilograms, three quarters of a ton of additional carbon in the, in, um, in the soil of every hectare of land in the carbon project every year. I'll just give you an idea of what that is. That's about half the equivalent of about half the weight of a smallish or medium sized car. So it's quite a lot of carbon basically being stored in every single hectare of land. And taken together, so there's 2 million hectares of land in the whole project. This means that in theory, they're storing about one and a half million tons of extra carbon and therefore creating one and a half million carbon credits each year, because a carbon credit is worth one ton of carbon. Okay, And that's how carbon credits get sold is by the ton. And over the lifetime of the project, they claim, which is about 30 year projects, um, that would create something like 40, 45 million carbon credits that can be sold to polluting companies. Um, the project officially started, you might be surprised to learn already on January the 1st, 2013. Um, it, although many people, as far as I understood last year when we visited the area, only really became aware of this, at, in fact, last year in 2022. So there's some implications of that that I'll talk about in uh, in a moment. <clears throat> uh, the first carbon credits from the project were sold in May 2021. Actually, a very long gap between when the project started and when they started selling um, uh, started selling carbon credits. Eight years, uh, and there are reasons for that. And, and one of the reasons is that in order to be able to sell these credits, they have to be kind of independently audited. They call it verification or validation They're by an independent, usually international consultant auditor. And so the project had to undergo this process. It started in about 2016, and it took them five years to complete uh, that, 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 that kind of audit process, which is an extraordinarily long time. It was usually over in a few months. And I'll say more about this in a moment, but what, one of the reasons is that it was it, it, it's clear because the, the audit reports from those auditors are all available publicly, and I've read all of them. Um, there are many, many hundreds of pages of it, but I've been through all of them. And what's clear is that the, the auditors actually couldn't understand how this project was working, and they found so many problems with it that the project could never actually explain, or they eventually did explain, kind of, and eventually the project was kind of audited, it was validated, and they started selling carbon credits. Uh, so far, up until December of last year, uh, about four and a half million of these carbon credits have been sold by NRT. And the big question is, of course, how much were they sold for? And the answer is, well, we don't really know because that information isn't made publicly available. Uh, we have to kind of infer guess if you like from other sources of information but my estimate is that they were probably sold for between seven and a half dollars to twelve and a half dollars each could have been a lot more actually so so far the the sale of these carbon credits has probably generated something between 34 35 56 60 million dollars something in that kind of 
um, order. Uh, they've been sold to many people, but uh, some of the big companies that have, have bought them include Netflix, you've probably heard of those, the streaming company, uh, video streaming company Meta, otherwise known as Facebook, uh, Caring, which produces um, luxury goods, very, very expensive handbags and things like that, for very rich people, and Angie, which is a, a French energy uh, company. These have bought you know, many tens of thousands of, of these carbon credits from, from NRT. And this is interesting, though. One of the things that, that, that I'll, I'll explain again in a moment, but, but just to look at the, the example of how this kind of carbon credit generation has worked at, a, at the level of the specific uh, conservancies. Because remember, it's the, it's the land in the conservancies that is creating these carbon credits. Um, you know, every single hectare of every single land in the 13 conservancies is, is kind of generating, notionally generating these carbon credits. So you look at uh, Bilico Belesa, it's about 378,000 hectares in area. Um, the amount of credits produced each year is 378,000 times three quarters. It's three quarters of a ton per hectare. So that's about 280,000 credits produced each year. Uh, so far, roughly four years worth of those have been sold. So that's maybe one, one point million credits that have been in effect generated by Bilico Belize Conservancy have been uh, sold. The value of that, if my estimate of the value of each of those carbon credits is right, is that the amount of the value of those that's been sold from Bilico Belize itself is about eight and a half, 14 million. Again, it could be quite a lot more. How much has actually been paid to Billy Cobalaces so far? I don't know exactly. When we were there last year and since, we've heard that each of the conservancies was going to get about 36 million Kenyan shillings kind of immediately, which is equivalent to about $260,000. Whether that's actually been paid or not, I, I don't know. Maybe more has been paid, maybe less. What we did get... Um, uh, recently was a list of the projects that NRT claims to have been funding through this carbon project. And here they are, there's there's a list of each of them for uh, for each of the, conserv the 13 conservancies. In fact, there's more than 13 conservancies, and I can explain that in a moment. So here's this list of the projects that they claim to have, have uh, funded with this, with this carbon money. They don't give any figures for how much each of these have cost, actually, uh, nor the total amount given by NRT to each of the conservancies from the carbon credit money. There's big questions about this, and I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that in, in, a, in a moment. Um, so we don't know exactly how much has gone to the uh, conservancies. Probably the boards of the conservancies do know that. Um, it would be interesting to ask, of course. What we do know, though, is that the way that the project is financially structured, most of the money does not go to the conservancies, even though the conservancies are actually creating the credits in a, in a sense that are then being sold. And I'll explain how we know this in a moment. But um, so as you can see from this chart here, about 20 percent, and it's somewhere between 10 and 30 percent, but let's assume it's 20 percent of the total proceeds from the sale of the carbon credits goes straight to a company called Native, which is a kind of marketing company, and it is responsible for selling the carbon credits. So it's 20% of it goes straight to them. It never even leaves North America. Northern Rangelands Trust takes about a third, about 32%, somewhere between 28 and 36%. It depends on you know how, how much money uh, Native, uh, the marketing agency, takes. So about, uh, yeah, about a third of it is going straight to Northern Rangelands Trust, so that's more than half already. About 30%, less than, it kind of goes into a pot of money that um, each of the conservancies can apply to NRT for, for projects that NRT has to approve, and then that money can be dispersed for those projects. And the, um, the rest of it, you see the these stripes here, there's 13 of them. That is how much each of the conservancies themselves are getting. And it's about 1.4% of the total amount of money that's being generated by the, by the sale of the carbon credits. It could be a bit less. It could be 1.2%. Anyway, it's pretty small. So that is how the, the um, 
uh, the project is kind of structured financially. And we know that because we obtained a copy of the legal agreement um, between NRT and each of the conservancies. Uh, and one of the interesting things you'll, you'll notice about this on the top left there, this was signed in 24, on 24th of June 2021. That was nine and a half years after the project started and actually after it already sold quite a large number of uh, uh, carbon um, credits. Uh, you can see here this was signed by uh, Tom Lalampa on behalf of um, NLT and then by each of the chairs of the, the, um, uh, the conservancies at, at, at the time. And that that contract sets out these these financial terms of who gets uh, who gets what and when and what they have to do in order to claim it and so on and so forth. It's actually, in my opinion, um, it'd be worth getting a lawyer to look at it actually, but really, but in my opinion, it's very kind of onerous on the uh, on the conservancies. There there are there are clauses in there whereby NRT can just not pay what it says it's going to pay to any of the conservancies. If they, if the conservancies don't fulfil their requirements and certain um, obligations, which aren't actually specified in the contract, so NRT could, in theory, just make stuff up, up and not pay the money that's um, uh, owed to the conservancies. <clears throat> and to me, I think this raises a huge amount of questions. Actually, and I'll, I'll just go through them quickly. I mean, for a start, obviously, well, why is this marketing agency and NRT getting so much of the money? They're not actually doing very much for it, um, to be honest, in my in my opinion. It's more, as I say, and it's definitely more than half of, of the total amount of money. What will NRT spend its money on? I mean, I say they're guns and fences. I mean, this is what I think a large part of what it spent some of its money on in the past, then ranger salaries to control the livestock more and control the, the movement of people. I mean, what exactly is it going to spend, you know, what is potentially many, many millions of dollars on? Uh, this really important question is, is, is NRT actually distributing the right amount to the conservancies? Now, I mean, that depends on obviously knowing how much they've been selling the carbon credits for, and that isn't publicly available. So you can't easily check that. At. NRT doesn't, as far as I know, has never published any audited financial accounts. So how do we know how much NRT is actually getting from the sale of these carbon credits? Because unless you know that, you can't tell whether they're distributing the right percentage of it to the conservancies. Um, why is most of the money um, for the conservancies discretionary, i.e. you have to, uh, the conservancies have to apply to NRT to get the money? even though, in effect, they've been generating the carbon credits and the money in the first place. I mean, some people who I spoke to last year have the view that this is actually very much a way of NRT in, in, in increasing its its control over what the conservancies um, actually do. And, you know, the suspicion would be that they would tend to feature and, and prioritise things like wildlife conservation, protecting the core area, the ecotourist lodges, the infrastructure for that, and so on, all the kinds of things that we know NRT particularly likes to do, and perhaps fences. <clears throat> and who will determine, you know, which, which of the projects that conservancies apply for uh, get approved, and, and how? How does that get determined? This isn't answered um, by any of the documentation that I've seen, and NRT hasn't made that clear. How much say will the actual communities have, not just the boards of the conservancies but the actual communities uh in in each of those conservancies how much say will they have over which projects get um proposed and actually get supported and the automatic money that's going to uh each of the conservancies that's those small slices of money like one 1.2 percent. 1 i mean what's it actually for i mean we understand it's it's to do with rangers and it's to do with implementing this this, this kind of controlled planned grazing regime, but it's not, again, it's not clear exactly what that money is going to be used for. And then another question, why are all the conservancies getting an equal amount? Because they are all getting an equal amount. It, it, it would seem odd because some of the conservancies, such as Billy Beleza and the Serra, are much, much bigger than some of the other conservancies, but they're all getting the same amount. And that, I think, is one to think about. 
there are more questions about this kind of going beyond just the financial structuring of this project one of the most important ones is who was informed about the project exactly and and when well we know this contract uh, was signed between NRT and the conservancies in middle of 2021 like I say nine and a half years after the project it, according to the kind of rules of these kinds of uh, projects there should have been consultation before the project even started um, as the uh, project involves the lands of primarily indigenous peoples of various um, groups um, they should have had the absolute right to proper free prior and informed consent to the project they should have had the right to say no if they didn't want it and they should have the continuing right to 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 consent to it um the audit uh process for the project as i said it took four or five years whatever never really found proper evidence that nrt had even thought to inform communities about this project let alone to get their consent in fact they there was a suggestion in one of the reports that nrt had basically faked some of the evidence that uh it it presented about the the, the process of informing communities in, in various um meetings around the conservancies in about 2017 something like that still way after the project had already started why was this contract between the conservancies and nrt signed only <laughs> in june 2021 i mean in theory i mean NRT claims otherwise, but in theory, there was no or a questionable legal basis for the entire project before that, because NRT was selling carbon credits that the conservancies were producing, and NRT itself didn't really own, to be honest. So it didn't have the right to, to the things that it was selling. So there's big questions about that. Who was aware of this contract being signed in, in June um, 2021? Clearly the chairs of the Conservancy boards were, but who else? Who else in the communities actually agreed to this? Yeah, who authorised the boards of the Conservancies to sign this contract? And again, you know, what exactly is the legal basis of the project? It's, it's very unclear in Kenyan law. In fact, there's a new law being proposed as of the last couple of months or so by the Kenyan government to regulate these kind of carbon projects and carbon offset projects. But there hasn't been such a basis in the past, and the basis, the legal basis that NRT claims is very, very questionable. Particular questions about whether the project ever complied with the requirements of the Community Land Act 2016. Uh, so, I mean, what I said so far, and I'm, I'm sort of slowly coming towards the end, and I, I do appreciate this is, this is a long presentation, but um, and, and thanks very much for your sort of patience and, and forbearance um, with this. What I haven't said anything about actually is the the kind of some of the technical issues about this project. And I'm not going to go into that in, in too much detail um, because it is very it is really very complicated and in some ways perhaps not not really so relevant. But um what I would say is that I, I as I mentioned, because this um process, this project, as with all of these other kind of similar carbon offset projects around the world. They have to be open to um, an audit process, which has to be done independently, and all of the documentation um, surrounding that project and the audits and so on, and the monitoring reports produced by the by the project itself have to be publicly available. And that's all overseen by, again, it's another US organization called VERA. Uh, it used to be called a voluntary carbon standards, but it's now called VERA, and it kind of centralizes all of the documentation about all of these projects, and it oversees the audits and so on and so forth. So you can see a huge amount of documentation about this project up on this web address here. Um, the VERA registry entry for the uh, North Kenya Carbon uh, Project. Something to note there, this number at the end, 1468, that is the registration number for the nrt project in the vera system if you have that number you can find it okay and just to give you an example of this there's all these this is a list of the documents this is only about a third of them actually so there's there's a huge amount of documentation as i say i've had the misfortune to have to read most of it um it, it, and it, it some of these are i mean there's thousands of pages of documentation there um some of it was very confusing i have to say but anyway it's all there um for, for scrutiny. 
So anyway, so that's what I've done is I've analyzed this. And, and, and one of the things we, well, multiple things that we found is whether this is a legitimate um, carbon project anyway, and whether the supposed kind of climate benefits are even really happening. Um, you know, go, go back to where we started, and that's the, the claim that NRT is fixing the problem of there having previously been overgrazing of this area, and that it's kind of planned rotational grazing, taking control of where all the cattle can be grazed, moving them around according to some theoretical plan, is actually any better in terms of the vegetation and the amount of carbon that stores uh, than the traditional systems that have been in place for hundreds of years there. In fact, NRT never presented any evidence for either of these things. A, that there was a problem in the first place, or B, that NRT's grazing is actually better than what was happening anyhow. So the whole kind of question is, well, who is storing, who's creating the carbon credits then? And what is creating the carbon credits? Already comes into question with that. Because if it's not actually doing anything, then there are no carbon credits being produced. Um, as I said, there's no actual empirical evidence. No, 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 no one has, there's been no evidence published where someone has gone out around the project area, they've dug up the soil, they've measured how much carbon is being stored in it, and they say, this is how much carbon there is now compared to how much there was before. Or that shows that you know, we are really storing more carbon in the soil. That's never happened for this project. There's no empirical evidence. Um, and yeah, so there's a, a whole bunch of issues here that, that, uh, that are really very troubling. Um, you know, it, it requires NRT to essentially take control of all the livestock and where the cattle move and where they, where they uh, graze. One of the really the things that I found most, most troubling about this was that it's a requirement of these kinds of projects and this project in particular that the cattle are all supposed to stay all the time within the project area. That means within those 13 conservancies. They're kind of allowed to move outside, but that, that for reasons that's quite complicated to explain, I won't try, but it's, it's kind of bad for the project. It reduces the number of carbon credits that the project generates if the uh, cattle wander off or they, they're taken off for, you know, uh, to go graze when there are droughts, if they're taken down to Mount Kenya, whatever, that all, that all reduces the amount of carbon credits that the project can claim. So the project at least has to say that it can monitor where the cattle are pretty much all of the time, actually, whether they're in the area, whether they're being moved around according to this supposed planned rotational grazing, or whether they actually move off the project area and move somewhere else, like you know, to the, to the north and south, wherever. And you know, th 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 and they can't actually do that. They're, 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 as I'm sure you, you're aware, you know, they're, they're, there's 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 no way in reality, in fact, that most that, that much of that area can be properly monitored by by NRT. You know, it's a vast area. The borders aren't even marked on the ground. So very difficult to know that, and and you know that's a, again a, 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 a serious kind of technical problem with the project, and you know, it does raise the question: well, what if NRT actually tried to enforce those boundaries? Supposing they stop people from moving their cattle to other areas when they have to, when there's a drought, for example, if you can't move them south to Mount, Mount Kenya, what happens? Um, so you know, and potentially very, very serious uh, consequences of that. So that I find very worrying. Yeah, as I say, the legal basis of some of the projects is is unclear or or, or is being challenged. Then, of course, there's the questions of uh, human rights abuses and the fueling of conflict. Well, we, there isn't. A, we're not suggesting that that human rights abuses have got worse or there's been more conflict because of the project. But it's possible to foresee this happening in the future with this huge influx of money. And what I didn't say is that if you were to project out over the next, well, now 20 something years left of the project, how much money NRT could potentially, or the project could potentially earn, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. So that's, that's a lot of money, you know, maybe a quarter of that or a third of that going to NRT is a lot of money that can potentially do a lot of damage. So 
if it's spent on the wrong thing. So again, you know, this is worrying and, and, and requires a lot of um, scrutiny. And and just like, also just just to say, so in, in the because I'm really nearly finished now. In the process of, um, of re investigating um, this project, we got access to hundreds of the internal documents um, from the project. Now, I mean, so you go back a bit to 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 show that. NRT is implementing this so-called planned rotational grazing and it's keeping the cattle inside the project area. What they've been doing is every month, every one of the 13 conservancies, every month since you know, 2013, has been producing what they call a, um, a livestock movement map and a grazing map. And you see here a couple of examples of that. On the left there, that's Malaco Conservancy. Let's see on the right here, it's Bilico Beleza. This was from uh, January 2015. And the thing is, if you look at this map, and, you, and many people there will know just how big that, <laughs> that those conservancies are. If you look at those maps and even look at them very carefully, as I have done, they don't really show you anything at all. I mean, they don't even show what cattle were there, what you know, where, where the main movements of animals were. They don't tell you if there's there's cattle moving in or out of the conservancy, nothing essentially. So as a basis for kind of demonstrating that the project is doing what it claims to do, so this is all, this is completely useless, basically. It's not really showing that at all. And in a, another example, I mean, look at that. What, what exactly is that showing? That's Nasulu Conservancy in January 29. There. I mean, what, what is that showing? <laughs> it's it's I mean, like, there, there are thousands of these and we've looked at them and they're all pretty much as bad as these each other some are a little bit better but but they're, they're, a lot of them are very very bad like this so i mean the point about this is that we we think what this shows is that nrt doesn't for the most part have a clue what's going on in most of these conservancies and it can't demonstrate that it's actually implementing the 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 the, the supposed plans to, to change the grazing patterns here in which case well again where what are, where are the carbon credits coming from because nothing's actually changing there or very little's changing Anyway, so we're pretty much finished. And um, but just to say some some things that have happened in um, uh, in the last few months or so. Well, the, the first thing is that this international body is responsible for overseeing the kind of credibility of these carbon credits. It suspended the sale of these carbon credits from NRT in January twenty twenty three. Uh, so, it, the, so the project has actually stopped um, selling, has had to stop selling carbon credits from now. As I said, it's already sold about four and a half million, but now it's, it's on suspension. And uh, related to that, there's a review being undertaken of whether this is a legitimate project, whether it's followed the rules, whether it's consulted properly, whether it respects the laws and so on being undertaken by this uh, VERA organization. And that's been going on now for about three months, I think, if I'm not mistaken. It's quite a serious process. It could lead to the complete termination of the, of the, of the project. And you know, one of the things you'd hope is that this comes down and asks people in the area, you know, what's your experience been with this project? What do you know about it? What benefits are you getting from it? I'd be interested to know very much if anyone has heard anything like that happening. Uh, some of the sub-conservancies, not all of it, but some of the sub-conservancies in Namanyak withdrew from the project in 2022. One of the results of that actually was that there's been a, a complete reorganization of that of that conservancy. And I think there were three sub previous sub conservancies in Namanyak that have now actually become three individual conservancies. So the number of conservancies supposedly inside the project has actually gone up. Um, oh, yeah, and there was a there was a, a, a very big area uh, added to the Melico Conservancy, and thus the actual project area has got even bigger, in fact, since um, about the end of last year, or middle of last year, I think it was, there are questions being asked, and I think again by Namanyak, about the distribution of, of benefits from the project. We know that the government of Kenya sent, uh, sent a kind of investigation mission to NRT sometime around April 2023. We don't know what they found. There hasn't been a report of that. We don't know what the outcome of that uh, is likely to be. Although, as I say, there is some a draft new piece of legislation being prepared by the government to, to regulate carbon trading. 
Another quite interesting, a very interesting development, I think, actually, was that just this last week, um, the governor of Kajiado County, which is in southern uh, Kenya, obviously, which includes another very similar kind of offset project, uh, has decided he wants to basically rip up all the, the carbon project deals and just essentially stop the projects um, because the he says too opaque for local communities. So that could have kind of interesting consequences if that were applied elsewhere. But there are certainly questions about you know how much communities know about many of these projects and, and including NRTs and how much they really ever consented to. And of course, there's the ongoing legal challenge over uh, the establishment of Benico Blaze, and I, I, I'm not sure what the status of that is at the moment. I think there was meant to be a hearing in May, I don't know if that went ahead. And another important thing is that in the last well, six months, eight months or so, the value of carbon credits has really dropped very quickly. And you know, I was saying maybe on average the NRT's credits were being sold for ten dollars each. They could be worth you know less than two dollars now. It was not that they're being sold anyway, but generally the the value of these carbon credits has, has dropped very, very rapidly. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that there's been a lot of critical kind of international media coverage, people questioning whether these really do any benefit for the carbon, whether they're essentially kind of fraudulent. Um, and a lot of the big companies have stopped, essentially stopped buying them. So there's no there's no kind of demand for them anymore. Well, look, that's that's it. Um, that's it for me, at least. And uh, thanks very much for listening. Uh, I hope you've still got plenty of time next for um, questions and answers. And, uh, and I hope that was helpful for you all.